please now join me in giving a warm welcome to Asa Hutchinson, Governor of Arkansas and Chairman of the National Governors Association. Thank you, Bill, and for the support of the National Governor Association. Thank each of you for being here in Bentonville uh, for this regional uh, conference in support of uh, the Computer Science Initiative. And I hope everybody had a good time last night. Uh, I did, enjoyed the visit and the hospitality. Uh, I want to thank uh, Governor Lee for uh, coming uh, here uh, from the neighboring state of uh, Tennessee. He's been a good friend. and. Bill, thank you for joining us today. We look forward to your remarks in a little bit. Uh, and also want to thank the funders. Without that, we could this couldn't be possible at all. Uh, but from Deloitte, Western Governors University, American Electric Power, Microsoft, Philanthropies, Walmart, College Board, the Walton Family Foundation, Amazon, Best Buy, Google, and Thinking Media. Please give uh, them a round of applause and express our thanks. Now let's get to it. Uh, studies have shown that computer science courses establish foundational skills like problem solving, teamwork, and critical thinking. It's also a high earning potential. It has already been pointed out. It's a pathway to prosperity, uh, but it's for them, it's a return on their investment for college tuition, which is six times greater than that of their peers in other sectors if you're majoring in engineering, computer science, or information technology uh, degrees. Uh, but we have a long way to go to see that that opportunity is available across the country. And as of last year, 51% of public high schools in the United States offered computer science. Another way to express it is that 49% do not. Uh, and uh, of course, I reflect back whenever it was a 10% figure uh, whenever I started my campaign uh, eight years ago. So we've made progress, but we have more to do. And so to help expand computer science education nationally, uh, I've set five policy goals for the chairman's initiative. One, to increase the number of high schools offering computer science classes. This is measurable. Uh, this is doable. It's going to happen, and uh, that's what we're engaged in. Secondly, to increase the number of governors who are members of the Governor's Partnership for K-12 Computer Science uh, Coalition. We want to grow those numbers, governors that are committed to this effort. Thirdly, to increase the amount of state funding for computer science education. We all realize the dollars drive policy and changes, and you've got to commit state dollars to it. And so that's a goal to increase the number of states. And then to uh, increase the number of states that require at least one computer science credit for high school graduation, important criteria, and then to increase the diversity of students participating in computer science education. Today, uh, I look forward to hearing from the panel uh, that Secretary Key will uh, lead uh, of school commissioners, education commissioners from multiple states, anxious to hear what's happening in your arena of the world best practices and how we can get uh, these goals met. But then, uh, as a real highlight for me, is to hear from the student panel later today and to hear how computer science has impacted their life and increased their opportunities. And let me recap just for a second uh, on our computer science initiative. Uh, we had a session in Denver, which I consider a regional meeting. Uh, we had a, a session at the uh, National Governor Association in Washington, D.C. We're having this regional meeting here in Bentonville, in which we have multiple states, and then we're going to have in May a regional meeting in Boston. And this was designed so we can reach and hear from as many states uh, close in that region uh, as possible and to drive uh, the policy. My final point is that uh, we have a unique opportunity because of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act which provides $65 billion for broadband expansion. And Secretary Raimondo, a former governor that we served with, emphasized that the funding is flexible enough to be used for expanding digital literacy. How would you define digital liter literacy? You don't need to answer that, but I think it's a very broad term. 
that you can use the investment that we have from the infrastructure bill for computer science education, digital literacy. And that's a unique opportunity for us. And so as uh, NGA chair, I look forward to working with our fellow governors to make sure this is effectively implemented, but it also makes a difference. As I indicated, I'm glad to be joined by uh, Tennessee's Governor Bill Lee. And I know he'll make comments on it, but Tennessee has made real progress in its efforts to expand access to computer science education for K through 12 students. It takes leadership, and when you have a governor that addresses computer science in his state of the state address this year, you know he's serious about it. He's leading the legislature, and I'll let you uh, talk more about what's happening in Tennessee, but uh, let's welcome Governor Bill Lee. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, and um, thank you for leading. You, uh, when I came into office a few years ago, uh, Governor Hutchinson was one of those who was quick to connect and quick to offer wisdom. And it's it's one of the benefits of the National Governors Association. Uh, one of the great benefits that I have found in the position I'm in is to be able to share best practices and get ideas from people around the country. That, that's what this is about. So I really do appreciate your leadership. And as a result of the example that you've set for other governors uh, in Tennessee, we've made a very strong push to, uh, to improve the level of opportunity our kids have in that state. I, I, I've only been, I, I ran for governor for having never had a political office before. And I got there in part because of my interest in education. I mentored a kid in the inner city uh, through an at-risk youth program for many years that I worked with. I got involved in that kid's education and I saw how incredibly important it is and how incredibly difficult it is for a large part of our population, the children that are in our state, the barriers that exist, the, the systems that prevent opportunity from making its way into their life. And it was, it propelled me to get involved in education and education reform and education initiatives. It's part of the reason I decided to run for governor. So uh, to, to uh, come in and have uh, governors like Asa lead the way and show governors like myself how to do this. It's it's uh, and with the coordination and the efforts of the NGA is very important. In Tennessee, uh, we only have about fifty percent of our public high schools offer computer science. But after this year, because of a piece of legislation that I have brought forth, uh, we will require computer science for graduation in Tennessee. We have, <laughs> it's already been discussed that huge jobs uh, gap, skills gap, and I have a STEM background because I'm a mechanical engineer. I have an engineering background. I witnessed firsthand in my own life that the opportunity that becomes available with a broader STEM focused skill set and computer science is a very, very important part of that. So we are also, uh, when I came into office in 19, we, we started something called the Future Workforce Initiative uh, with a goal of tripling our STEM designated schools. We've trained 500 teachers. We've created a statewide set of standards for computer science. We are requiring that all schools K through 12 over the next, uh, over a four year period of time that all K-12 schools will incorporate computer science uh, in their, both their elementary, middle school and high school programs. And then, like I said, we're gonna require it as, uh, as a component of graduation. So we know that this is important, uh, but we also know that the best way to make this happen across the country 
is to elevate that conversation and to share practices and to gather and to hear from experts and to engage our departments of education uh, in the best way to get this done, the most efficient way to get it done, uh, the most cost effective way to get it done. And so that's what today's about. I'm very proud to be here. And y'all are great hosts. And this is a beautiful city that I've never been to before. And uh, even though it's right next door, uh, you do have to come all the way across Arkansas to get here, I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you and Susan for hosting us and, uh, and all of us in your great state. Uh, thank you, Bill. And I believe before we turn it over to Secretary Key, uh, we have a, a video. Education is an issue that we lead on and that brings us together. We are facing the fourth technological revolution. Our students who are graduating today are graduating into jobs that we can't even dream about, and every job is a technology job. All of us are looking for pipelines of talent, and to create that pipeline, you need to start early, you need to have mentorship and help, and then you need to pipeline that talent back into your organizations. We passed a law to mandate that computer science be offered in every high school in Arkansas. We've been able to see computer science grow from, you know, roughly just under 30% of high schools offering computer science to about 51% today. That's just in the past eight years. We had 1,100 students approximately taking computer science in 2015 when this initiative started. That is now over 13,000 students in Arkansas taking computer science. A lot of people, when they hear the term computer science, they think programming is not just programming. It's robotics, it's cybersecurity, it's networking, it's those soft skills, it's the ability to tell stories with data. Everybody has aptitude and not everybody has access. You need to have a plan to be able to get from point A to point B and that just doesn't happen overnight. I think this would be something that certainly we would be and I think the Business Roundtable and other groups mm -hmm. would be happy to partner with the NGA on saying, here's the blueprint, it's your fifth tenant, and how do you execute that? The states need to develop a plan, they need to put that plan in action, they need to try things, they need to not be afraid to take risk. We want, as a nation, to increase the number of high schools offering computer science. Secondly, we want to increase the number of governors who are members of our Governors for Computer Science. Not every kid graduating will go to college, but every kid is entering a digital economy. And so this is a new foundational skill that's critical that we don't leave anyone behind and that we continue to meet the talent needs of our companies. Great, thank you. So now we're going to turn to hearing from our state education leaders to discuss the paths that this, their states have taken uh, to help improve educators and students' digital literacy and to reach those students who might need extra support to explore these options. So to moderate this session, I'm glad to turn to the Arkansas Secretary and Commissioner of Education, Johnny Key. Mm -hmm. Secretary Key was appointed to his role in 2015 by Governor Hutchinson. Secretary Key has previously served as both an Arkansas State Senator and State Representative, including serving as a member of the Senate Education Committee. And we've worked with Sec Secretary Key on many issues over the past year, and he's a great person, and he's going to do a great job uh, moderating today. So welcome, Secretary Key. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, Governor Hutchinson. Governor Lee, welcome. Uh, enjoy working with your team over at the Tennessee Department of Education as well. You've got some great folks uh, there and we work well together. And I'm happy to uh, start off this panel by bringing you a bit of the Arkansas perspective and then moving into hearing from leaders in five of our other states about the, the work they are doing in this area. And thanks to the leadership of Governor Hutchinson, we have made tremendous progress in this area over the last seven years, including, uh, as has been mentioned, a new law requiring high school students to take at least one computer science course before graduation. You know, every, uh, uh, every generation or so, uh, we have to come as a society to determine 
what is it that our students need to know and be able to do to function in the world that we have? And at some time in our history, we decided that everyone needed four years of English and four years of math and three years of science. And we really get comfortable with those things. And it's very hard work sometimes when you add to that list. But it's necessary to add to that list as the world changes and as we have entered and are well into this digital age, our students need this exposure, not to become necessarily experts, but because they need to know how the world works in the area of computer science and the digital aspects. Four keys to our success that I believe can be summarized in, in these four points. One is legislative support. It was possible to go through the executive branch to do this, however, it's always important to get legislative buy-in. They are the ones that actually hold the purse strings. So it's very important and it's longer lasting when the state legislature is involved and the governor has been able to develop key relationships and key partnerships with our state legislative leadership and making uh, the, this a reality as well as the next piece, which is dedicated funding. We have supported the expansion of computer science education with an annual appropriation fully funded uh, and has increased over the last several years. Uh, this funding is distributed to teachers and students. Uh, it, it goes out in the form of support for teachers. It goes out in the form of incentives and, and rewards for students, as well as uh, incentives for teachers to expand their knowledge, to increase their capacity to teach computer science. Another key element was the creation of a state office of computer science and a leadership position uh, that has been critical to advancing uh, the governor's goals of computer science. Uh, a full-time position dedicated to computer science education uh, at the state agency helps coordinate this as a statewide initiative. And I would be remiss if uh, I didn't say it also is critical to have the right person filling that role and uh, Anthony Owen, where's Anthony? Anthony Owen, our state director of computer science, and uh, without his leadership and work, this uh, would not have been as successful. So Anthony, thank you and your team. Yes. And last, but probably the most important, is leadership from the governor. A state leader prioritizing computer science education can be important is critical, I should say, to the success of the initiative. And we have been blessed to have Governor Hutchinson's leadership in this area. Uh, but whether it's the governor or state education chief, public leadership is necessary to create and build the will for the expansion of computer science education. I know that uh, in those early uh, commercials, uh, when Governor Hutchinson was running uh, for his first term in office and really set uh, the political world a buzz uh, when he came out and had a very firm commitment to establishing computer science as a priority. Um, you know, and he followed through on it. A politician, Congressman, that uh, followed through on his promises during his campaign. Uh, and uh, we are uh, better for it in the state of Arkansas. And now I look forward to hearing about how other states have approached their expansion of their computer science initiatives. So on our panel this morning, and our panel uh, will be to uh, three members of the panel to my right and two members to my left. But we have uh, Richard Hartley, who is the senior policy advisor uh, for Governor Edwards of Louisiana. We have Don Morrison, Alabama Computer Science State Administrator. We have Diane O'Grady Cuniff, Director of Maryland Center for Computing Education. Dominic Sanders, South Carolina Computer Science State Supervisor. And my friend and colleague, Commissioner Margie Van Dieven from Missouri. And I will start with you, Margie. Margie, uh, and I would ask all the panelists to take about three to five minutes to describe the, what's happening in their state uh, with the, this, in, in answering this question, for you, Margie, what are the biggest challenges you see in advancing computer science education for all K-12 students, especially the unique challenges of reaching students in rural areas? 
Thank you very much, Johnny, and it's great to be here. We appreciate it very much. Governor Parson sends his well wishes. He wishes he and his team could be here today, but I am uh, ha happy, happy to be here. So, uh, you know, I, I think I would start my remarks with when anybody asks me about what are the challenges in X and education, I would respond in a very similar fashion, and then I'm going to get in directly into, uh, into computer science. We have a real critical issue with our educator workforce today. And uh, I will say, echoing the words that once our governors start acknowledging that and elevating that, um, it really is a game changer for us. So I'm very grateful to Governor Parson and Missouri for elevating. I'm very grateful to the two governors who are here today who have paid very close attention to what's happening with our teacher workforce and are working to solve that issue. Why does that matter for our computer science? Uh, we absolutely must have highly, if we're talking about training the next workforce, we have to have the best trainers there in the classroom to do that. And um, I heard one of the, um, on the video talk about starting at our earliest years. When we look at the data that came back from uh, the, the impact of the pandemic, a few things that we did see is we saw the most significant impact in our mathematics scores, and we saw that most significantly at our early, with our earliest learners. High quality instruction matters for our children. Getting them excited about learning about some of these complex areas matters for our children. And if we don't have a highly skilled and trained uh, teacher workforce who are um, de delivering this uh, computer science content, we know they resort to tools. We know if they're not comfortable talking about some of these, they resort to tools when what we're trying to get uh, is thinking, problem solving, and our kids are ready for it. I, I'll never forget the, uh, you know, it was several years ago now where I had um, a first grader explaining to me what he was doing on his iPad and growing and doing his, and he was using the terms algorithm and he was talking about, it. he was, ex and it, it was fascinating. And what I found the most exciting about it was, is that here are his teachers going, would you tell the commissioner of education, this child was like, oh, I could, could not have been bothered more to have to explain because he was being interrupted from his work and he was so so he was great he was but but they're ready for it our teachers are not quite there it is it's complex it's changing constantly and uh, so to me that is the greatest challenge why does this uh, particularly challenging in the rural areas you know i think access is huge and so we also saw that the digital divide uh, very pleased that uh, governor parson has deeply invested in, in making sure we solve that digital divide in our rural areas uh, going forward. Um, we need to do that. We saw that. Uh, but it's also access you know, to industry. I will be uh, next Friday, governors, I will be in the boot heel. And you will, you know, a lot of our teachers in that area come from Memphis. They're trained in Memphis. It borders what's happening in, in uh, Eastern part of Arkansas, I have to get my directions right here. Get, so it's a very different part of the, of the country. They struggle with industry. They struggle with access. They struggle with some of the areas that we really need to help them. And so I think for our rural students, it's exposure, it's access, and it's getting those uh, great adults who are excited. One more quick story. I stopped at a school on my way down here yesterday because I drove. And, uh, you know, being from St. St. Louis area, it's a big deal when you cross the river to go to Illinois. We border eight states. It is not a big, I, I only knew I was in Arkansas because it said, welcome to Arkansas. I mean, it's a very easy trek across state lines. And so we share a lot of the same issues. So really appreciate being here. But I was in one of our career centers in uh, about an hour from here. Great opportunities for kids. It was exciting. They were learning. Um, but a number of their teachers who were there were, uh, had come from industry. So how do we get the, the people who were involved in computer science industry back into our classrooms? This was with diesel mechanics. This was with construction. And they said they just loved coming back and teaching their trade. How do we do that with computer science as well? Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Margie. <laughs> Don, Alabama now spends over a million dollars a year uh, dedicated to computer science education. How has that dedicated state funding been important to your work? Need to hit the button. Thank you so much for that question, Johnny. Um, again, good morning to Governor uh, Hutchinson, and certainly on behalf of um, our Governor um, Kay Ivey, she does send her regards for not being with you all today. But um, again, my name is Dawn Morrison. I work at the Alabama State Department of Education. 
I've been championing uh, this work for more than a decade alongside um, Dr. Jeff Gray, um, associated with the University of Alabama. Um, but in response to your uh, question specifically, uh, Governor Ivey has committed uh, more than $11 million since 2017 to computer science. And um, as a matter of fact, um, our legislation is in session and um, we are seeking an additional $1 million um, that will bring um, our total funding for the CS for Alabama line item in the Education Trust Fund to $3 million annually. So we're, we're very pleased with that. Um, it has already passed the House and um, we are um, very confident that it will um, then, you know, pass the Senate and um, be signed. Um, so that funding is very important for our efforts in Alabama, much like, uh, you know, the commissioner has spoken to. Um, we have um, dedicated a lot of that funding toward professional learning. Computer science was new content knowledge for so many of our teachers. And so it is very important that we provide them the necessary support um, and equip them with that uh, content knowledge so that they can turn that back around and uh, deliver it you know, to our students in our states. Additionally, you know, um, we grapple with those same issues and concerns. If you jump off of the I-65 corridor in our state um, and you move beyond the Huntsville's and the Mobile's and the Birmingham and the Montgomery area, uh, to the east and the west, we have very, very, very rural communities. And so um, our governor also is um, deeply invested in expanding broadband access to those areas. Because again, without the infrastructure in place, we could talk about computer science all day and we can talk about unplugged activities, but that's um, certainly not um, you know, reality in terms of equipping those students with the necessary skill sets if we want to put them uh, into the workforce. And so um, we are also on top of the um, dedicated line item um, with regard to state funding, we were awarded a, um, a 2019 Education Innovation Research Grant as well by the USDOE that fo focuses specifically on um, expanding access to computer science in our rural communities. And so um, again, funding is extremely important. I'm glad that it is one of the, the tenants, if you will, that uh, Governor Hutchison has identified in order to really um, expand and broaden participation uh, for computer science for all students, whether they live in a rural environment or an urban setting. So thank you. Thank you, Don. STEM is, is a very broad topic and computer science is part and parcel to that. And Louisiana has incorporated STEM education, including cybersecurity into your CTE pathways. Tell us, uh, Richard Hartley, a little bit about the Louisiana story and how the state has worked across the K-12 and post-secondary uh, education areas along with industry sectors to make this happen. All right, thank you, Johnny. It's great to be here with all of you and be discussing this very, very important topic. Uh, my hat's off to Governor Hutchinson for the compact, K-12 compact that you're, you and the NGA are sponsoring. Uh, Arkansas is special to me. I started first grade at, right, at a little school right outside of Forest City, Arkansas. So, and I love my first grade teacher, Miss Helen Brunson. She's the reason I wanted to go into education. So she was wonderful. Uh, but a quick answer to that question is that through our Fast Forward Louisiana's Fast Forward initiative, we've blurred the lines between high school, higher ed, industry, and the workforce. Fast Forward is rethinking the high school experience. Louisiana is moving towards a more personalized and flexible high school experience that prepares students for success after graduation. Through Fast Forward, we provide three pathways that students can choose to go through. Our Jump Start 2.0 is an associate degree program. Students can graduate when they graduate high school. They also leave with an associate's degree that will enable them to enter the workforce right away. Uh, also, we have a Tops University associate degree. Tops is our our uh, scholarship program for our students uh, that reach a certain grade point average, a huge program in Louisiana. But if students choose that pathway, they go to a four-year college, four or more years as we all know now, but they enter with two years of college already. And then we have our third pathway is high school apprenticeship program, which allows students to enter the workforce after high school with an industry-based certification. And a Louisiana school district can now choose from 39 new pathways and more than 50% of those pathways are STEM. 
And uh, so our State Board of Elementary and Secondary Education approved all 36 associate degree pathways and three apprenticeship pathways recommended by the Department of Education. But prior to the recommendation, the pathways underwent reviews by our State Board, by our Board of Regents, by Louisiana Workforce Commission, Louisiana Economic Development, who has been a wonderful supporter of, of pathways and computer science education as well. And then our career technical education supervisors from large and small school systems. A lead school system from each of Louisiana's eight regional labor market areas developed pathways for that particular region. System leaders studied regional workforce needs, collaborated with higher ed partners and business and industry professionals to design offerings tailored to the local community. And all the school systems had the opportunity, and they did so, to participate in their region's planning. And uh, Louisiana, again, our economic development, they were fantastic in the role they played with this. We have a very close relationship between workforce development and economic development. It's kind of unique, I think, among all states. Uh, Louisiana Economic Development has Fast Start, which has been ranked the nation's number one workforce development program for an unprecedented 12 years in a row. And it, it addresses the need for tech talent through the recruit, train, and sustain model. It's a great program. And uh, Louisiana Economic Development it, uh, it has also committed millions of dollars in direct investments to higher ed institutions, to our schools, uh, to expand the number of graduates in computer science and related fields. And I've got a lot more I could say about that, but I don't want to take up a lot of time. But uh, also in 2021, the Cybersecurity Education Management Council and Louisiana Cybersecurity Talent Initiative Fund were created for the purpose of developing degree and certificate programs in cybersecurity fields. We have the cybersecurity kind of superhighway between Monroe, Ruston, and Shreveport because of Barksdale Air Force Base there too. It's all working very closely together with the universities and Gramlin State there too. Uh, the council is comprised of representatives of the Board of Regents, higher ed institutions, economic development, the Workforce Commission, and members appointed by the governor. We're very excited about uh, what this is going to do. We also have some other statewide initiatives that we're approaching. Uh, governor Edwards just approved us buying for the whole state uh, learning blade, which I'm really proud to say that we're doing. And by the way, I should have said right off of the bat that uh, I'm here representing Governor Edwards. He wishes he could be here. Our legislative session started Monday. Uh, but Learning Blade is an incredible tool. That we Some systems are already using it, and um, it's just bringing about some incredible results, and we're expecting to duplicate that across all our systems, provide it for public, private, homeschool associations. Everybody will have access to that, and uh, so we're excited about that. We have another initiative, the Star Academy. Is, the governor has funded five of those, and uh, it's the whole curriculum is taught in middle school through hands-on based projects, and it has a lot of coding involved in those particular modules that they, are, they will do. What's really special about that is we can blend this very well with Learning Blade. Learning Blade, and it, it has 20 hours of coding that middle school students get, and I think that's so important. And uh, a lot of our school districts are very rural. A lot of kids, unless they're exposed, with intentional exposure, and that's what I think Learning Blade, some of these other things do. It gives us intentional exposure to those kids about the opportunities that are ahead for them, and it opens up a wonderful world. And uh, so, and that's what educators have to do. We have to open up kids to the possibilities of what they can do, and that's why I think this initiative is so important. And Governor Lee, so happy to hear about what y'all are doing, what y'all are doing with required. I think that eventually will come about in our state. We have some bills right before the legislature now uh, concerning STEM and, and some of the intentional, intentional uh, uh, things that we want to provide to the students. So we're excited about that. Again, education is so important. I'm glad to see the passion that's in this room uh, without teachers without people putting a vision for you. I know I would not be where I am. I was in Arkansas growing up. I was one of 11 kids. My dad had been in prison in Mississippi State Penitentiary. He had a fifth grade education. My mom a seventh grade education, but she kept us in school. And so I appreciate all that my first grade teacher did for me, <laughs> Governor Hutchinson. 
and thank you for the great leadership you provide. It's amazing how many people remember their first grade teacher. Right. Juanita Baskin was mine. And uh, <laughs> you remember them by name, right, Governor? And you remember the contributions that they made. And thank you for mentioning Learning Blade. Uh, they have been a critical part of the success in Arkansas and most recently developing uh, coding block courses uh, for us. And uh, moving that work all the way down into the middle school has been tremendous. Um, and speaking of, of uh, middle school, we're going to move over to Maryland. And we're going to hear from Diane O'Grady Cuniff. Uh, Diane, this was the first year Maryland required all high school students, or all high schools, sorry, to offer computer science courses. So we want to hear about that implementation, but also your approach in Maryland requiring computational thinking to be taught in middle schools. How has that foundation been so important in supporting the progress at the high school level? Thank you so much. Oh, I have to get closer. <laughs> I think in Maryland, we're really proud of the work that we're doing, led by Governor Hogan and the team that's there. And um, we like to brag on what we're doing because we think it's working really well, but we so much appreciate the leadership that's here and the collaborative way all of this is moving forward and how people are lifting this up is important in so many different ways. So um, Secretary Key, you picked those four areas which I think are so important to the success that we're having. And if you don't have strong bipartisan legislative support, if you don't have the dedicated funding, you just can't move forward with this kind of work because it's so big. Um, because we had all of that in Maryland, we were able to go to scale, we're able to sustain it. We started in 2018 and now every high school in Maryland offers computer science. And that means students in every school take computer science and at this point, I only have data from 2020, but at that point, 25% of students graduating from a Maryland school had taken a computer science class. So we see ourselves on a, on a good trajectory in order to get to the point where every student gets exposed. I think it's really important that we've kind of divided this up into steps, the way that speaks to having that sustained funding, and that's having those positions, right, the third thing you mentioned. If you have full-time people who are dedicated to this, and those of us that are here, we are completely dedicated to doing this work. And it's wonderful to have the help of others in figuring out not just what to do, but what not to do. And I've learned so much from colleagues in that area. But the support of leadership to lift this up, to keep it going, to sustain it, so that when the governor has kids together for a hackathon, or when he shows up, or he tweets something, it just makes a difference and it lifts us up and it keeps everybody going in spite of the two years we've just passed that have cut a lot of things out of what's happened in education. In Maryland, we're always looking at the diversity side. And so our requirements when we set out was that every high school offers computer science, but that every district, and we only have 25 districts in Maryland, so it's kind of easy to get everybody together but that every district show that they're making efforts to diversity. And that speaks to the middle school part, because how do you convince high school kids to take a class in something intimidating if they've never been exposed to it? And so even though the original requirements were put it in high school, work towards the diversity, have a plan, our State Department of Education slid in and added under the ESSA requirements, and in a very visible way that shows up on the Maryland report card, that every middle school student must be exposed to computational thinking. They must have a well-rounded education. And that lays the foundation that gets more diverse kids into the high school classes. Um, trying to do a bunch of things at the same time is this interesting juggling act, because at the same time you're trying to put it in the high schools, train the teachers, build your facilitators, look into new areas. You also have to build your pre-service programs for your future educators are not going to be coming into your schools with no background and you're starting from the beginning again. And we realized that the challenge of putting computer science into elementary school to lay a foundation for the middle school was a lot the same as the challenge of putting it into the pre-service programs because it's just figuring out where do you fit that in when there's not a dedicated course. So it's, you know, a fascinating ongoing challenge to be part of. I feel like when we lift up any one part of this, we're lifting all of us up. When one of us has accomplished something, I feel like it, it kind of pulls us up along. 
and I've had that sense all along being part of this project. And so again, I so much appreciate what people have done to lift us all up. Diane, you mentioned putting it in the ESSA plan uh, for Maryland. And those of you from other states who want to find an angle for how to approach that, uh, the Ever ESSA, Every Student Succeeds Act, replaced No Child Left Behind, and that gave straight states great flexibility in creating their accountability system. Uh, and if your state does not have that as part of their accountability system, that is, uh, an, could be an entry point uh, for including computer science or that type of work as part of your state accountability system. So thank you, Diane, for bringing that up. Now we'll move to South Carolina, uh, home of one of my top two favorite commissioners of education, Molly Spearman. Uh, the other one is sitting over here to my, to my right. Uh, and Dominic Sanders, uh, you are uh, doing work there uh, in a state that now requires a computer science for high school graduation. Uh, how has uh, South Carolina seen the courses benefit broader learning during high school and their prospects after high school? Uh, thank you for that question. Again, Dominic Sanders, uh, Computer Science State Supervisor for South Carolina. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, so the graduation requirement was um, very pivotal to the work that uh, we've accomplished there. Um, it all starts back with the uh, diversity, access, and inclusion piece. Um, so when we started out on this journey, we wanted to make sure that our one goal was to prepare all of our students in South Carolina for the jobs that are here and also the jobs that are not that have not been created. So when we first started out um, all with the graduation requirement, it started out at 43%. So you know, like anything, you always have those early adopters. And then as each year went on, it got better. So 18, 19 school year, it went to 69%. Um, 19, 20 school year was at 80%. And then this last year was at 92%. But uh, for me, the most um, important piece is um, it's right on par with um, our male to female ratio. So now we have 46 uh, percent of our female students taking computer science and then 54 percent of our males um, taking computer science so it really speaks to that graduation requirement in regards to um, diversity access and inclusion so we're making sure that we're making strides to ensure that all of our students um, know that computer science is more like a problem solving tool and that they know that they can also obtain the jobs um, that are here today and the ones that have not been created yet great Thank you, and uh, thank all the panelists. And now uh, we'll move to what would be the lightning round, but there's only one question, and I'll throw it out there, and any of you panelists uh, can answer. Uh, what would you have wanted to know before embarking on this work? Go ahead, Dominic. I guess I'll start it off. Um, what I really wanted to know um, before embarking on this work is just um, the uh, importance of policy um, because we know policy really drives the change. So as a teacher or as a district or um, any of those individuals, you can fight and advocate for something, but if you don't really have the policy backing it, it really makes it a little bit more difficult. So because of the policy, um, it helps my job uh, become easier and it also helps um, districts and um, schools be held accountable because I can always go back to the policy and when you have policy in place it's kind of there's no like black and white areas so of like hey well based on the policy these are different things we need to get done and people are like okay well let's work on that so if I would have known a little bit more about that I think I, I would like to know too some of what I'm hearing today where is this important to be a standalone and where is this important to be embedded into the content and where do you start making it a standalone and where do you, I mean, th those components, uh, I think earlier the question was, how are you defining some of these uh, components for learning? Uh, so what are those essential skills that are necessary? Where do we introduce them in our K-12 systems? And how do we embed them? Because it's such a part of everything that we do that it doesn't um, always need to be a standalone. It should be embedded in so many other areas as well. But I, what is it? So those would be my questions. Great question, Commissioner. I don't know that it's unique to Alabama, but certainly when we passed our uh, Computer Science um, Act in 2019, it was uh, quite explicit, and the provisions um, clearly stated that um, high school and middle school would actually offer courses, but in our elementary grades, uh, K-6, um, as defined in the legislation, that it would be integrated and there would be a um, 
focused specifically on computational thinking skills and coding applications. Um, so there are no courses tied. Um, certainly because there are no courses tied in the elementary level, it does make it a little bit more challenging from a data collection standpoint. And so if anybody in the room has figured that out yet, um, I am open to um, receiving those suggestions. I would just echo what they said, especially what Dominic says. I think if you knew the, the policy that would put in, you can put in place that would easily bring about the changes you wanted, that would be nice to know up front, but we don't know that, so we have to work with what we do, but that was a good point. All right. Diane, you want to add something to that? I do. One thing, I mean, not that I didn't know, but I don't think I knew it well enough, was the importance of the teamwork that was involved in this work, whether it's the facilitators and the trainers, whether it's the industry, whether it's the higher education partners, our computer science teachers association, the expanding computing education, the CS for all our script teams who do the work in each district. Every district has a group of people that meet regularly to look at their plan, evaluate it, pick the next steps, come back together. Um, I knew there were teams, but I just really didn't see how very, very important that was. Well, I wish I had known that uh, we would have, when we started this work in 2015, that five years later we would have a worldwide pandemic. Uh, and, and so we could plan for that. Uh, and I'm sure our two governors would have liked to have had that as well. But at this point, governors, I want to turn it over to you to ask a question. Governor Hutchinson, uh, do you have a question for the panel? Uh, Dominic, because I'm a little jealous, South Carolina, I think, was the first state. Uh, you like hearing that, don't you? <laughs> uh, first day to uh, require its graduation credit. So how did you uh, pull that off? And you, that, was, uh, that was sort of your first salvo, I think. Uh, you just went full bore in there. But give me a little more background and the impact of that and the challenge that uh, you faced. Because still, I think we only have about four or five states. Uh, Tennessee will soon join us. But to give us a little bit more on your experience there. Yeah, so uh, for a while, South Carolina has had that graduation uh, requirement. Um, at first, it really um, really wasn't defined as computer science. Uh, back then, computer science was more on the keyboarding side. And then um, as the years uh, went on, it got a little bit more granular. So then that's when we started to say, hey, this is what computer science is. This is what computer science isn't. So of course, um, that came with its own set of challenges um, because to get the districts and the teachers and schools um, on board. Like I said, um, as the years have went on, um, it's gotten um, a little bit easier with the um, dedicated funding as well as us um, being strategic on our strategic uh, partnerships that we've created to train our teachers, such as like our uh, CSPD week. Every year we at least train at least 250 teachers annually to get them um, up to speed. Um, so I think that has been um, the success point of it, but yeah, at first, like I said, we've always had it, but then it was just the point of getting it more um, concrete on what computer science is and what computer science isn't, because at first it was very granular. Governor Lee, you have a question for the panel? I'd, I'd be interested to know how you've engaged the private sector in what it is that you're doing. Um, it seems that we all have a great opportunity to engage with the private sector in meaningful ways, but we, I'd just like to know if you've had experience with that. So, um, great question, Governor Lee. Um, certainly in Alabama, um, there are two ways that uh, Governor Ivey has engaged uh, the public, uh, the private sector uh, in our computer science expansion efforts. Um, I, well, I must go back to um, her creation of um, the Computer Science uh, Advisory Council. And uh, on that council, she was very intentional about including, um, you know, some strategic partners um, that represented uh, some of our major corporations. So that was the first piece um, of engaging those from the uh, private sector. The second piece, again, going back to our computer science legislation in Alabama, um, it did call for the creation of a computer science task force and that's in addition to the Governor's Computer Science Advisory Council. It also states that there has to be X number of individuals from the private sector. You know, this is an interesting one for us as well because it's one where 
education doesn't have to engage the business. They're coming to us this time. I mean, they're, we need you to respond to this call. They need, and so I'm really excited that you're gonna get to hear from one of our students who is in, not in a rural part of the state, who will be able to describe some of the excellent partnerships, but the demand is really coming from the, the private sector. They need us right now to produce. Um, and just to echo what Don said, um, the first and foremost, like the creation of this role, uh, so like the supervisor role, that was very key um, for us. And then also the creation of a task force and then also um, utilizing our Chamber of Commerce. So uh, I meet with them probably regularly, maybe at least once a month. Um, and then that kind of helps us get more into the private sector. So I tell them, hey, these are our needs of our teachers. These are our needs of our district. How can we work together to create a more uh, cohesive ecosystem? So that's who's been uh, very helpful for us. Governor Lee, I'll speak uh, for Arkansas's experience. Uh, governor Hutchinson appointed a, a governor's computer science task force. They generated recommendations. We implemented many of those recommendations. Uh, but then we brought that group back together, and uh, he, he appointed a follow-up uh, task force to review what we our progress to the, that point, and then issue another set of recommendations. And I think those recommendations have been a driver for us uh, to move forward into not just uh, limiting our work to the K-12 space, but also moving it into the CTE and post-secondary space, making the connections between what st the students are learning, certifications they are earning, and then job opportunities that are out there in the state of Arkansas. Anyone else want to, yeah, Richard? One thing we've done in Louisiana is made a regional outreach and we've used our universities, our junior colleges, and uh, our local school districts to do that. And that's proven to be a very, very effective way uh, to do that. And that, that's also a workforce commission. You, we've used those councils to make the outreach. And it's really amazing when you see it start happening, uh, you get one or two businesses or industry in there, others want to come in and they will seek you out. So, but it's because it's intentional. I think you have to do that and understand that. So, Secretary, may I add one more thing um, to that question? Um, you know, in addition to, um, you know, the private sector being engaged, going back to the funding question you initially asked, um, the provisions in our legislation were, again, quite explicit in that the funding could only um, be um, allocated to um, institutions of higher ed in our state as well as nonprofits. So um, many um, beyond our, um, you know, the corporate environment, they also have those, um, you know, nonprofit entities associated with their, um, you know, their corporations. So. Governor Hutchinson, do you have another question? Well, just had a little bit of a follow up comment based upon your remark about the pandemic that we didn't anticipate. And it made me uh, think about uh, uh, whenever we started this initiative in 2015, as you remember, Johnny, I went out to high schools and held assemblies with students saying we're offering computer science. We encourage people to take it It's your choice. And we'd made a presentation. It was usually very, very well received. But I went to one high school and it was in a very rural area of the state. And they just looked at me like I'm from the moon. I mean, they had no interest. They had no concept of what this would mean in their real life. And so it was just so distant. And that is one change though that the pandemic brought. All of a sudden, it, it, it impacts everybody's life and they understand it better. And so uh, it was mentioned, and I appreciate the comment, the challenges in the rural areas, you know, uh, showing them what this means to them. The other little anecdote was uh, back in 2015, I was so proud of our initiative, I thought I would go out to Silicon Valley and brag about it a little bit. In my naive mind, this was going to attract them to come to Arkansas. And they were genuinely excited about it, but they said, great, we're going to go to Arkansas and we're going to recruit all of your students to come out here and work in Silicon Valley. <laughs> and I thought, this is not working right. So I have not been back to Silicon Valley. <laughs> but contrast that to this last year, a tech company came into Arkansas 
and said, we want to recruit your students. They can work for our company. We have 1,200 employees. We're located out of state, and they can work in whatever small town they live. Obviously, they'll be working remotely, but they'll be paid a high salary. And of course, I promote my uh, family continually. And I said, well, I've got a grandson graduate from college, major in computer science. And the CEO said, well, you tell him he's got a job with six of his friends. I mean, they're desperate for that. But the point, of course, is how things have changed as a result of the pandemic and how this really makes a difference in the young people's lives and their communities. And I think they can see it better. As we wrap up uh, this portion of the day, uh, I do want to acknowledge that this work would not have been possible without the partnership of our school partners. And today we have uh, in the audience uh, Dr. Jared Cleveland uh, with the Springdale School District, Dr. Debbie Jones, who is uh, superintendent of the Bentonville uh, School District. Uh, and then our education service cooperatives have been a tremendous partner uh, in this. And uh, Mr. Brian Law, Mr. Greg Grant, uh, directors of two of our education co-ops and there may be other educators in in the uh, our midst today and I want to thank you publicly for your partnership in helping us uh, make this work um, as you have heard there are uh, there this is important it's important work but there are many paths and each state can uh, blaze its own trail as it approaches this work in computer science education and we want that to continue uh, we've never wanted this to be just an Arkansas thing. If we did, Governor Hutchinson would not have made it a hallmark of his term as chair of National Governors Association. Um, but uh, we'll work to make this happen together, and all the states will grow, and I think our nation will benefit from this work. So please thank our panelists today.